Good morning. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the cathedral this morning, whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us through the wonders of the technological live stream. You're all very, very welcome. Do take the pew sheet away with you and have a read of the notices at your leisure. Just a couple of things to draw your attention to. Um, a notice that isn't in the, uh, in the pew sheet due to paperwork only being finalised at the end of last week um, is the wonderful news that we have appointed a new education and families officer. This is a really exciting development for the life of our cathedral as it's a role that will really help us develop our offering to children and their families. And I'm absolutely delighted that someone who is very well known to us, our own Julie Allmark, who's desperately trying to avoid my eye line and hiding there on the front row. Uh, she's over there if anyone wants to have a look. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that Julie gave a wonderful interview and we're so pleased that she'll be officially joining uh, the team as a member of staff here in that capacity. So do please pray for Julie, pray for her family and pray for us as we embark upon this really exciting uh, new chapter in the life of our cathedral. Our Eucharist this morning is being sung for us by the Hereford Chamber Choir, directed by Simon Harper and accompanied by Sam Bayliss. And we extend our welcome and our deepest thanks to them for enabling our worship this morning. When we come to the time of communion, as ever, communion will be administered on both sides of the tower crossing on the plinth here. A reminder that we don't uh, currently allow the practice of intinction, which is the practice of dipping the consecrated host in the chalice, and that's purely down to grounds of hygiene. Other than that, you are very welcome. We hold a moment of stillness now before the choir lead us in the introit, O oh, sing joyfully unto God our strength. You are all most welcome.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In their own ways, both our readings this morning speak of the power of witnessing to Christ. Together they will remind us that we who have encountered Christ at the empty tomb and we who will encounter him in this Eucharistic feast cannot remain there. That we have a message to share in a hurting and hurt world. Perhaps today, especially in light of recent news, let us pray that the Holy Spirit will stir up in us the courage and confidence in our faith that we too might bear witness to the one who has triumphed over death for us all. And so we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore rejoice by putting away all malice and evil and confessing our sins with a sincere and true heart. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive you your sins. Open your eyes to God's truth, strengthen you to do God's will, and give you the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
As we stand, let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and you know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. For the word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. While the eleven and their companions were talking about what they had heard, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. May I preach in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are many things about the direction in which the Church of England is heading that are making me anxious and grumpy in equal measure. The increasing centralisation, the imposition of secular models of management, the undermining of parochial ministry, the lack of understanding of rural ministry. I could go on, but at this late stage in my ministry, I recognise that it is all too easy to sound like a miserable old Which would be a pity, because although I am anxious, I am not without hope for the future of our church, which welcomed me into the faith rather a long time ago. The church of the future will be much smaller, certainly, but I'm hopeful that it will also be leaner and fitter. But there is one particular matter that alarms me about the way that we are going. And that is the descent into a bitter culture war and the increasing dominance of fundamentalism within the Church of England. We seem to be forgetting the painful lessons that were learned in the 17th century 
when this country took up arms in religious conflict over different understandings of the Bible and engaged in a bloody civil war in which both sides claimed to be defending the truth. I worry about a biblically fundamentalist lobby that is especially vocal in our general synod. They have become something like a religious version of the Flat Earth Society, in which they cling to antiquated interpretations of the Bible, call themselves orthodox believers, and label those of us who question their antiquated ideas as being not true Christians. They stick to the Bible, which is fine, but then they apply a few carefully chosen verses of scripture only to those topics that suit them, while they shun other biblical passages that would challenge their understanding of God or of the faith. To give you just one example of how selective their use of scripture tends to be, we do not hear them mention anything about being put to death if you fall out with your parents, which is the mandatory punishment that is required by Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. I regularly fell out with mine. Biblical fundamentalism is reactionary and it's backward looking. It rejects the insights gained from centuries of biblical scholarship and tries to put back the theological clock. Its underlying fear of change offers no way forward for the Church of England. Surely the task of the Church today, and especially those who lead it, is not to tell people what to think or what to believe, imagining that we know all the right answers, but rather to encourage people to think critically about what our faith in the risen Christ means in the world today and how it should be applied to daily life. We firmly believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. He is the way because faith is a spiritual journey, not an unchanging set of beliefs. He is the truth, while we are called to be seekers of his truth, not possessors of his truth, because only our Lord possesses his truth. He is the life, and we are called to be doers of deeds that witness to the forgiveness and the love that he proclaimed, not simply thinkers of good deeds who never put our faith into action. Which brings me to today's reading from Luke's Gospel. As the light was fading on the first Easter day, the eleven remaining disciples and their companions were gathered together in Jerusalem, in hiding, afraid and in shock, traumatised by what had happened on Good Friday and feeling the shame of Jesus' condemnation and his humiliating execution on the cross. His broken body had been laid in a tomb with a heavy stone rolled against it, and his disciples were deep in mourning and filled with despair at the tragic end of his exhilarating ministry. They were also anxious about the possible repercussions of their association with him, were their lives now in danger? And then two of Jesus' followers arrive hot foot from Emmaus to tell them that they had seen the Lord and that he had made himself known to them in the breaking of bread. And then, like a genie popping out of the bottle, the risen Christ appeared before them. Luke tells us that the disciples were startled and terrified. And who wouldn't be? But once they realise that this is not a ghost or a figment of their imaginations, that this really is Jesus who stands before them, their fear turns into joy. 
And then we have that touching moment when the risen Lord asks for something to eat. He wanted to share food with them, just as he had so many times in the past. Once he had dined and relaxed and caught up with the news, Luke tells us that the risen Lord opened their minds to understand the scriptures. If only Jesus could do that for us today. And we are not alone. The people of Jesus' day had always wanted the kind of faith that makes everything simple and clear. Jesus was often asked by the Jewish authorities and by those who were curious about him, don't keep us in suspense. If you are the Messiah, just tell us in words that we can understand. A simple yes or no answer will do. But Jesus' reply was always, no, I am not going to tell you plainly. If he opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures on that first Easter day, wouldn't it be wonderful if he were to join us right now and stand up here and ask us, do you have any questions? If he did, what would we ask? Was there really an Adam and an Eve and a talking serpent and a magical tree in the Garden of Eden and an ark in which Noah survived a deluge of rain? Or what about my friends who are good people but had no interest in faith? Will they not be welcome in heaven because they had no faith in you, Lord? Or what about the big issues of today? What about the cost of living crisis, knife crime, the war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, climate change? What's your opinion on these matters, Lord? Keep it simple, please. Just tell us what to believe without making it too complicated. Tell us plainly. And after putting all our questions to Jesus, what would our reaction be if he turned around and said, no, I'm not going to tell you plainly what to believe. Would we then class Jesus as a fraud or a charlatan? As someone who simply doesn't know the answers to the questions and maybe has never known the answers? Because that was the interpretation and the impression that the Jewish hierarchy in Jerusalem formed of Jesus, they saw him as a political upstart and a troublemaker, as someone who was not to be taken seriously. Because when he was asked a straightforward question, he answered in parables and in enigmatic language. And because of their frustration at his attempts to dissuade them from seeing everything in black and white, they became angry with him and began to plot his destruction. If Jesus really were the Son of God, surely he would find a way to explain simply and plainly what those in authority wanted to know. But Jesus refused to do it. Actually, that's not quite true. He did say something along the lines of, I did tell you, but you didn't believe. You've seen how I've broken down the barriers between people and God. You've seen how I have accepted in God's name all those whom you view as outcasts and wrongdoers, and yet who are loved by God. You have heard me preach about the kingdom of God and what it entails. You have seen me, you have heard me, and yet still you do not believe. And here is why they didn't want to believe. They wanted to be told what to believe, and Jesus had spelt it out in two simple commandments. Love God and love your neighbour as yourself. But in their minds, those commandments were at once 
too simple and too vague. They wanted things spelled out in black and white, and so they continued their demands. Give us the facts, give us the truth, make it plain and simple and we will believe. And Jesus has said, no you won't. I have taught you and I have shown you and still you do not believe. Our Lord was making the point that the way to true belief is not found by telling people what to believe. Instead, it is found by learning how to believe. For example, how can we know if forgiveness really works unless we experiment by forgiving? How can we know whether the power of acceptance really works unless we test it by accepting? How can we possibly take Jesus seriously unless we strip him of the sanitised clothing that has been placed on him throughout the centuries? Especially in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is presented as a signpost to the liberating God who proclaimed a ministry in which he expects us to think for ourselves, guided by the Holy Spirit. Which means that it's all right to ask questions. It's all right for us to express doubt and to explore the new and to probe the unknown. That's how our faith grows and the church's doctrine develops. One of the weaknesses of some vocal sections of the church today is that they are preaching a message in which everything is presented in stark black and white, in which choices are binary and very sharp. Such a message squeezes out far too many people. And besides, real life is not like that. When it comes to matters of faith, and when there are choices to be made, we must take account of the many shades of grey and the amazing spectrum of other colours. Because human beings are made in the image of God. And God intentionally made us to be a reflection of his kaleidoscopic glory. As John's Gospel tells us, Jesus came that we might have life and have it in all its abundance. Perhaps that's why Luke presents Jesus as teaching people how to believe, not what to believe, and how to think, not what to think, saying to everyone who trusts in him, come, follow me, enjoy fullness of life in the kingdom of God, and along the way, please engage your brain. As ones made in the image of God's kaleidoscopic glory, we stand to affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. In our Gospel reading, our Lord Jesus asks his disciples, why are you frightened and why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Today in a society where values are at odds with the Gospel message, it is all too easy for us to lose courage or to have doubt. So we pray for the Church in this time and in this place. Risen Lord, invigorate your church, inspire our worship, encourage us in our mission, and make us confident in the faith we profess. Make our worshipping community one of generous love and inclusive welcome, of gracious service and quiet humility. Lord, hear us. Last week, the Church commemorated the life of the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, put to death for opposing the tyranny of Nazi Germany in the 30s and 40s. Bonhoeffer wrote, Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Risen Lord, give us the courage to stand up to oppression and injustice wherever we encounter it. Give our political leaders the integrity to challenge Russian aggression in Ukraine and to denounce inhumanity on all sides of the war in Israel and Gaza. Help us to fight for the weak and innocent, where they suffer at the hands of the strong. Lord, hear us. And we pray for innocent victims of human evil. For the young child in Gaza, whose entire family has been killed by a single bomb. For the catastrophic hunger crisis, developing in the Darfur region of Sudan, where one child dies every two hours as a result of malnutrition. And this morning we pause in silence for a moment to remember the victims and the consequences of Iran's hostile actions. Risen Lord, we bring you the helplessness of the weak, the anguish of the bereaved, the hopelessness of the starving. Hear your children in their suffering. Lord, hear us. As we remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we give thanks for theologians, biblical scholars and preachers who, through their work, have brought the Bible to new and wider audiences, and through whose scholarship and teaching, we are challenged to open our minds, to think and to respond. We pray with Saint Jerome. Risen Lord, you have given us your word for a light to shine upon our path. Inspire us to meditate on that word and to follow its teaching, that we may find in it the light 
that shines more and more until the perfect day. Lord, hear us. We pray for those in our community who are ill and need our prayers, for those in our hospitals and in St Michael's Hospice, for those contending with a frightening diagnosis or with a long course of treatment, for those with a chronic or terminal condition. We hold before God Hazel Wilmont, Maria Fruznia, Michael Golby, Natasha Carter, Helen Rowell, Alexander Smith, Mike Bayliss, Margaret North, Moffy Jackson, Felicity Rutherford, Yvonne Graham, James Wichard, Jean Hodges. Risen Lord, come to the aid of all who are sick or weary or anxious. Hold them safe in your loving arms. Lord, hear us. We pray for those who have departed this earthly life, those who have died recently, Derek Volpe, Glenda Young, Malcolm Culmer, priest, Chris Pope, David Jones, Peter Foster, and those whose year's mind falls at this time. Donald Francis, Peter Wilmont, Tony Hunter Choate. Risen Lord, welcome your servants into your heavenly kingdom, where pain and suffering are no more, only joy, peace, and life eternal. Lord, hear us. Finally, in a moment of silence, we bring our own prayers to our risen Lord. Heavenly Father, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as his death has recalled us to life, so his continual presence in us may raise us to eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the risen Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of that peace.
be with you. up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give you thanks, almighty and eternal Father. And in these days of Easter, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed us once more in paradise and opened to us the gate of life eternal. And so, in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever the hymn of your glory.
We accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, Lord by, by your, your cross and, and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Saviour. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, and with him, and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven. We worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia.
Let us pray. Living God, your Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in all his redeeming work, who is alive and reigns now and for ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go, go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia.